For, for those of you that are new to ESD, we're, we're well into the second decade of a continuing collective ESD and OSPI partnership. As, as we scan other state relationships between our counterpart ESDs and the respective state departments of education, we know that our nine ESDs collaboration with OSPI is really exceptionally unique. As of last month, we completed an entire school year, believe it or not, working through pandemic challenges. Our OSPI and ESD partnership has grown tremendously during that time out of necessity, really during this historic times. In effect, given the pandemic recent challenges and coordination and communications and ever changes in guide to the state level and the national levels, we've experienced the equivalent of about five or more years of 24 seven work together during the past 12 months. As a result, I believe our schools and our school districts uh, benefited greatly by the partnership. OSPI's strong commitment to the partnership is demonstrated not only by the amount of time senior ESD and OSPI leadership spends together solving problems and challenges, but also OSPI's financial commitment to fund the network coordinator position. With clear support from OSPI, Jessica Vavris has been instrumental in our evolving partnership throughout the last year has effectively acted as a coordination bridge between OSPI and ESDs. And I just wanted to take a, a moment to go off script to recognize not only OSPI's strong support uh, for that position, but also the work that Jessica Vavris has done during some incredibly difficult times. Without that bridge, we certainly wouldn't be as good as we are. So special recognition to, to Jessica for her work, well-deserved. Together, our OSPI and region delivery system coordinate and implement implemented over 15 statewide initiatives uh, that support tribal combat schools, private schools, and 295 school districts. And depending upon how you wanna measure that success, that adds up to over $35 million worth of revenue coming in. And over the last couple of years, we talked earlier this evening, we've got uh, documentation, it was $50 million worth of additional revenue as a result of the partnership. In addition, specifically, our state superintendent remains one of our strongest and best advocate for ESDs in the state legislature. We're exceptionally fortunate to have a state superintendent with a broad background in the classroom as a school board director, a staff member of the Washington Community and Technical Colleges, and also as a Washington legislator. Since January 2017, our state's K-12 work has been focused on equity and supporting the whole child, championing technical education pathways and strengthening the OSTI partnership with the state legislature and other K-12 partners, not only throughout the state of Washington, but throughout our nation. So, so with that, would you please join me in welcoming our state superintendent, Chris Reichdahl. Thank you, Greg. I really appreciate the introduction and <clears throat> really just want to double down on the thank you to Jessica for her leadership in that executive role. Uh, to Melissa Gomboski, who um, many of you may not get to work with on a daily basis, but you've got an incredible champion uh, advocating in the legislature for the work of the ESDs. It's been a remarkable year. And uh, as I sort of uh, remind my team all the time, you know, we came in here four years ago, a little over four years ago, and I was pretty resolute that the training delivery model, whatever we were fortunate to build, no matter the content, would be primarily driven out through the ESDs. Um, you're trusted, your local communities understand, um, you know, the educators in those communities understand the hub of excellence in each of their regions. And so there's just a higher level of trust and fidelity when we send uh, professional learning dollars through the ESDs. What no one could have imagined though was the COVID impact and how much time we would need to spend in partnership just on making sure that messages were consistent, that we were getting really difficult questions answered in real time from the various regions. And so each of your superintendents um, were absolutely the backbone of OSPI, ironically to say that, uh, for the last year. Uh, we didn't move without a regular, every couple week conversation, sometimes every week, sometimes multiple times a week, uh, through some of the toughest decisions, whether we were trying to give feedback to the governor on executive actions, or we were coming up with really impactful guidance here, uh, where we had to make some determinations. You know, from John in the Puget Sound to, to Dana in 113, to Michelle in 171, and to all of you across the state, there's no two regions that are the same. I mean, quite literally, the needs of your communities are so different. So as we built guidance, we couldn't find that place of sort of uh, on balance excellence without listening uh, pretty intently to the nine ESDs. 
we turn that into a statewide call uh, that we've now gotten down to about every three weeks or so. Uh, but it's it's way more frequent than it ever was before the crisis. But during the crisis, this was, uh, you know, an every two week kind of a call statewide. Uh, lots of superintendents, business officers, teaching and learning experts, some school board members, some of you along the way. Uh, we just needed to make sure that everything we knew was almost real time to the field uh, to the extent that we could do that and not violate, you know, the governor's considerations um, or Department of Health when they were in contemplation or labor and industries or another group. But uh, this has been a phenomenal year. I'm very grateful for the partnership. Uh, it will permanently change our activities here. Uh, just by way of a small example, you always had regional ESD meetings and we've assigned a cabinet member for many years prior to me uh, with Randy here as well and Terry, somebody from the cabinet would get out to an ESD meeting and they were a good listening ear, but they didn't always have a breadth of expertise or content uh, that was really perhaps timely for the needs of that ESD. So for example, what we're doing now is, you know, we've all gotten better at Zoom or Teams or whatever your preferred methodology is. And so what we've committed to is, is obviously not every meeting, every month, every region, but on a regular basis, our executive team members, um, which is you know five or six of us, uh, will be in, in those conversations. So we're gonna try to be super timely uh, from our executive team to you all. But prior to that, you know, the work in early learning, the work in ELA work, the math contracts, the, the trying to get ESDs at the center of professional learning around the state's big priorities, that's turned into supports for career connected learning and really ramping up student pathways to uh, CTE, professional technical programs and, and the connection to business in the community. We would not have pulled off this year, <laughs> last summer, the training of tens of thousands of educators and how to teach at a distance, right? Even last summer, we knew we were going into a year of just incredibly uh, challenging times. And um, it was dollars as quickly as we could to the ESDs and you all delivered that training and got thousands of educators prepared for their year. Now there's nothing more uh, real than learning on the fly. So you can't really replicate that, but, uh, but a whole bunch of educators went into that knowing that, you know, teaching in person is a very different experience than teaching remotely, not only learning your technology tools, but how do you establish lesson planning and student evaluation, student learning and student connection. That's the kind of stuff that the ESDs delivered on this year. Um, I could go on and on with the stuff that, uh, that your nine uh, regions have done in partnership with us, but, but it's, it's my way of saying thank you, recognizing you as board members, you've hired incredible talent in these organizations beyond the superintendents, your business officers, your HR teams, uh, your learning and teaching teams, you've got expertise that is layered through these ESDs that we connect to at OSPI. So we've got somebody at every part of the organization that's making a connection to these ESDs. So uh, hats off to all of you. These are kind of unsung jobs you're in. You get these appointments. Uh, there isn't high visibility in the community, but please know that we recognize the importance of this and selfishly uh, had these 11 people, your nine ESD superintendents, uh, Jessica and Melissa not been on the team this year, it would have been a very different experience for us. That said, we are going to move beyond this year. Uh, we are opening our schools, damn it, next year in full in person. <laughs> we are still grinding on the Department of Health to come off of six feet in common areas and actually come off of three feet in, in where we can. Uh, we're gonna have ubiquitous vaccination for 16 and over, certainly by June. And it sounds like we may get a emergency approval from the US, uh, US FDA on 11 or 12 year olds up for probably Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, J&J's clearly run into some issues here that they're gonna take a deeper look at. But there's a real scenario that we go into the next fall uh, with obviously unprecedented money, as you heard from Noel, and I'll, I'll briefly touch on a piece of it. Uh, we're gonna go in with pretty good guidance from public health around physical distancing and all the protocols we still have to have in place. Uh, we're gonna come into it with high expectations for student recovery and acceleration. Um, and our expectation is that we're going to launch our year next year as we would with maximum in-person opportunity. We know you'll have families in your communities who will choose to stay remote. They're not prepared uh, from sort of an embrace about this without vaccines for all. Some of them have really liked this. Uh, I don't think it's ideal for most kids to be candid with you, but I think some of them enjoyed this and, and are looking for ways to uh, partner with the school district for remote learning on a more consistent basis that doesn't cause them to leave the district to go find 
an ALE or an alternative learning experience. They want to stay connected with their local district. And we're delivering right now uh, some guidance that we're building for that purpose. So, you know, going forward, our commitment is to maintain all of our professional learning at scale through the ESDs to keep building a communication uh, expectation so that as we're thinking big strategy, big policy, big legislative moves, that it's always in concert with you. Uh, those of you who have been in evaluation models in, the, in, in your past know you don't wait till the end of the year to tell an employee, uh, you know, the good things or the bad things. It's an ongoing relationship. So that summative evaluation is not a surprise at all. Uh, that's what we want here. You need to be poking on us along the way <laughs> and not just uh, once a year. And I'm, and I'm really happy about that. Um, we've got a strategic vision here. As I said, we'll get through this. We will, we will manage through a public health crisis of uh, just unprecedented times, but we still have to push through to innovative teaching and learning and innovative opportunities. So we've designed uh, a concept here <clears throat> that, you know, really builds on what we started four years ago. <clears throat> You've watched us transform the assessment system and that's still ongoing. Build out pathways to high school diplomas beef up support systems for kids, focus on racial equity uh, and trying to move more resources where it's needed most. Some of our priorities at OSPI aren't always easy. Uh, we had to rewrite student discipline rules based on racial disproportionality. Um, and it's hard to move that through the system. But at every turn, we're thinking about what the next wave of opportunity is. And some of it builds on stuff we're already doing well. And some of it is, of course, uh, very unique. So I'll just rattle off some things you can expect OSPI to be pushing pretty hard for the next four years. Um, universal access to pre-K. We've got a system today serving about half of all three and four-year-olds. It is a hodgepodge of maybe you're federally funded, maybe your state, maybe you've got private scholarship dollars, maybe it's in home, maybe it's at a center, maybe it's public, maybe it's private. Uh, we don't presuppose the modality, but at some point the state has to make a commitment to every three and four year old getting universal, safe, uh, and high quality early learning as part of that child care experience. And that is probably the biggest thing we will ever do for student momentum. Intervening in eighth grade, intervening in 11th grade has no substitution for getting students really kindergarten ready and third grade uh, reading ready. And when we do that, boy, we just see incredible results in the data. Um, new K-3 literacy does have to come along, though. Uh, 49 out of 50 states have made almost no progress in early literacy. Uh, this is not easy, but there's a science to reading <laughs> and listening and writing that I think most states haven't embraced enough. And you can expect that we're going to kind of double down on the science of reading here in a few years and, and not so much that whole language. Uh, volumes of reading only gets you so far, and we've got to work with students with more intentional practice around that. Um, dual language, you know, I've been a champion of this. We're in more than 50 districts now with elementary school dual language programs, uh, one way and two way, pretty powerful stuff. Some of you are in regions with those schools, watching that K and that first grader and that second grader build language is phenomenal. They're learning from each other. They're, you know, students coming in with maybe two different primary languages. The opportunity is unprecedented. Um, if Washington and the United States does not embrace multiple languages and becoming multilinguistic, we lose the ability to compete long, long term in the, in the planet. Um, there are only so many Google translates that will work from afar. Um, at some point, you've got to put American capital and American talent uh, in, in, in regions and do it in a way that's culturally responsive. And language, by the way, changes the way the brain maps learning. The further you can bring language, the more powerful the outcomes are for students beyond language. Their math, their science, their history, all of that actually accelerates with dual language. So we'll be doubling down on that. High school and beyond planning, uh, it's becoming really ubiquitous in the legislature. Everyone's pointing to that as kind of the central thing that needs to move with students as they think about career prep and post-secondary choices. Uh, dual credit, we have awesome systems and they are completely inequitable. <laughs> the same student taking an advanced math class in one school gets no college credit. The student next door pays an AP test fee and might get credit if they pass the test. Two doors down as a student in a college and high school class, all they got to do is just take the class and get a decent grade and they get the college credit. And then they've got a fourth friend who drives to the local college for running start tanks. The same math class pays $1,000 out of pocket for transportation, technology fees, you name it, passes the class, gets dual credit. All four students at the same math level with four totally different dual credit experiences. And uh, we're going to have to keep breaking that, uh, that barrier down. Um, and just lastly, Big emphasis on high quality professional learning. The pipeline through higher ed in general right now is shrinking, but especially in education. 
Um, as much as we've done to move salaries up in the state a lot the last four years, uh, we compete with some pretty powerful industries that grab talent early. Uh, we're gonna have to be more intentional. Our push that you'll see from us and hopefully in partnership with all of you is to build comprehensive residencies for, for early professional teachers. No more six week, eight week, 12 week, one semester, uh, sort of part-time student teaching models where you're paying a second rent somewhere in a community, you're paying your college tuition while you're also working for free for a school district. We want the state to start to pick up year long residencies where these individuals earn a salary, uh, obviously keep paying that last bit of tuition, but you begin to uh, mentor them and bring them into schools in a way that recognizes them as professionals. If we can do that, include a little loan forgiveness, you will see an unprecedented embrace of young people for teaching. Uh, but right now that's a tough road. I'll conclude uh, not with any budget or policy stuff that's gonna get covered later on, but to say uh, double down a little bit on Noel's point earlier um, and Tim's point. We didn't like the way the federal money rolled out. I was one of those state superintendents who pushed on uh, Senator Murray and others to say your formulas are too rigid. You've gotta leave some flexibility in the states to get those dollars more equitably distributed. They love their title formulas in Washington, DC. They get to bang the table on, on poverty, even though they are not um, tools that are particularly working effectively. That said, we immediately partnered again with uh, your leadership across the ESDs, went to the legislature and said, use some of the OSPI, the statewide set aside money and all these ESSER funds, and let us get some of this money in the hands of ESDs. They have also been financially impacted by this. The federal formula is gonna address that. Uh, let's do this. And as Tim said, I think we're going to be in great shape, get several million dollars for this. And I may have some discretion to get more in your hands, um, either to stabilize you or to do particular projects. And I'm looking forward to that a great deal. Um, thank you. <laughs> Lots of work to be done here. You have thankless jobs, uh, but you also have teams that I am uh, inspired by. And, and I, again, I, I can't state it enough. This year would not have pushed us through uh, with the communication we had and the consistent communication to districts had it not been for your teams. So I appreciate you very much. Thank you, Chris. I think we've got a couple more minutes for some questions. Jessica, kind of keep us on track. Are we okay for time at this point? Take a few questions. Yeah, I think we're okay. I don't see any in the chat, but we're good for time. Any, anybody have any questions for Chris at this point? And while that question is cooking, we'd be remiss, Chris, also to not recognize uh, your deputy state superintendent there, Michaela Miller, and the new chief, Tennille Jeffries, who I know I call or send email to regularly, I'm sure my colleagues do, and the responsiveness is always appreciated. So just pass along, please, you know, our thanks for, for that part of your team as well. So questions for, for Chris at this point, verbally or in the chat or otherwise, anybody? Well, I'm not, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat and I'm not hearing anything. Chris, I think you, you stunned everybody into silence at this point. Uh, <laughs> well, it would allow me to, again, say thank you very much to you and your team, especially spending a little bit of time with us this evening. And you said it and I said it, you know, what a great partnership. And I think we're only gonna get better over time. Uh, and we've demonstrated that through success and success breeds success. So looking forward to continue to promulgate this great relationship that we have going. Awesome. There's awesome. a question in there. Well, go ahead, please. Uh -huh. uh, George's question. Yeah, there's a, I'm sorry. There's a question around pre-K required DCF, DCYF coordination. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Jordan. Thank you. No, no question about it. Um, our state is one, uh, I've been very candid about this, that has fragmented uh, P20 governance so dramatically that you've got eight people you need to talk to when you want to sneeze in education at the state level here. So no doubt about it. We will work with DCYF. They are the regulators of the early learning system right now, and they've built a lot of great competency and effective early learning, so high quality teaching and learning. But a lot of them aren't particularly, um, uh, didn't particularly come through teacher prep colleges or instructional design colleges or even learning assessment. So there is a partnership there. Uh, our message is it really ought to be a universal opportunity. We'll be the biggest provider. I'm confident of that in K-12. Uh, we bring most certifications. We bring the best training uh, to early uh, learning educators. 
and I'm, I'm pretty darn confident the state makes a commitment to all three and four, four year olds, the vast bulk of that will happen through us, but not all of it. There are folks who want to go to private centers. There are folks who are going to want faith based organizations. There are those who are going to still want mom and pop or the neighborhood uh, child care provider to be that, that person. That system still needs to ramp up and the learning part of that, I think, ought to become a basic education right for kids. Um, and, and that's really what we'll do is continue to push that policy and then continue to build out the opportunity where our school districts and our ESDs candidly are some of the biggest and most effective providers of that. So uh, already working with them, um, I think sometimes I get the ability to be a little more bold as a statewide elected and some of the cap governor cabinet agencies have to be a little more incremental. So undoubtedly we're making them a little uncomfortable these days with our big ambition and our big push, but boy, the legislature's already taken a monstrous start this year in that effort. Yeah, thanks for, for that, Chris.